pero esta gente era la que estaba encargada por acá. Suspected human remains and hiking boots found during the search for two young Dutch women. Two different types of shoes and bones were found last Thursday. Lisana Froon, aged 22, and Chris Kremiers, aged 21, reportedly went missing on the 1st of April after setting out on a hike. Is this a trail where you can get lost easily? There's no way to get lost. You actually don't need a guide. There are other people who have gone missing here, correct? Yes, correct. There's hundreds of cases like that. In my opinion, there's a murder still out there. It's hard to get information out of people because everybody in a little town like this knows somebody. So if you give up information on somebody, they might come back at you and it could get ugly. So people are very slow to give up information and very afraid. There were 90 plus photos taken yes. of just random things. Yes, I've shown them. They're creepy. Today I want to talk about what happened to Chris Kremers and Lizanne Froon. Chris and Lizanne were two Dutch girls who went missing on vacation in Panama. They went hiking and then weeks later one of the girls' backpacks was found. The thing is it was like in perfect condition despite being found in the river and inside there there were cell phones and a camera. The camera had like 100 photos and they were super creepy. They were all taken during the time that they went missing. Then their remains were found so the question then became, what happened to them? How did they die? The thing is, there's evidence that suggests it's an accident and there's evidence that suggests it was foul play and some people believe one or the other, some people think it was both. So there are a lot of theories about what could have happened in this case. So I wanna do what I usually do on my channel, which is I wanna give you guys the facts and then we'll discuss the theories and then you can decide for yourself. Chris and Lizanne, arrived in Panama on March 15th, 2014. I feel like I really struggled with that sentence. Chris was 21 and Lizanne was 22. So they're both from the Netherlands. They're very good friends. Chris is the one with the strawberry blonde hair. She's in a lot of the photos because Lizanne is the one taking the pictures because it's her camera. And they had been saving money for months to go to this trip to Panama. The trip was like a reward for them graduating but also they were going to learn Spanish and they were going to do volunteer work with um, some kids and you know touristy things as well. They arrive in Boquete on March 29th and they live with a local family. There was this big mix-up when they arrived and we know about this mix-up from Chris's diary so she kept a diary. Now this diary entry was on April 1st. This is the day that they were last seen alive and she's talking about what happened on March 31st, the day before. It's in Dutch, but I found a translation. It says, today was a strange day. We're going to the project for the first time. We were quite nervous and found it nerve wracking. When we first arrived, we introduced ourselves expecting the woman to know who we were because she was expecting us after all, but that was not the case. She showed no sign of recognition and said that it was not possible now to start volunteer work there and that we should come back next week. Very unfriendly and not at all warm or cordial. So when we left again, we were very disappointed. We were not received openly and did not feel welcome at all, unexpectedly to us. We also did not understand what exactly was going on. Then we went back to the language school to tell our story and get some answers. It turned out that there was no place or work for us after all this week, so we couldn't start yet. The school also found it very strange because we had planned things for months in advance. Then we had to wait all day for Marjolaine to hear if we could be part of another project for this week. Eventually, we heard that she had not been able to speak to the volunteer coordinator yet, so she wasn't sure, but she did think we should we would be able to start there. She also said that it was a nice project, and after reading about it, we also became enthusiastic. Tomorrow, they will try and get a hold of that woman and suppose that we will like it there then we can also just stay there. Because we don't really want to go back to Ara anymore because we didn't feel welcome at all there and it was really a huge disappointment. Let's hope that the other project is really fun. Well, let's go with the Panamanian flow then. The day she wrote this entry, they decided that they were gonna go hiking, but before they went hiking, they went for brunch. 
Then on April 1st at around 11 a.m., they decide to go hiking on the El, P El Pianista Trail. And it was meant to be a short hike. They only had one backpack between them. They didn't have any food. They were dressed really light, just like shorts and tank tops. Then they were texting their parents every day. And then when their parents didn't get texts from them for a couple days, they began to worry. Five days later on April 6th, the girl's parents arrive in Panama from the Netherlands. And then there are also Dutch police and detectives, search dogs that came with the parents and they began searching for Chris and Lizanne. Then two months after the girls went missing, someone found Chris's jean shorts. At first it was said that the jeans were found zipped up and folded on top of a rock along the riverbank. And experts thought that maybe she like took off her shorts and placed them there as a marker in case they had gotten lost and they didn't know if they passed this place before so maybe that was what she did but then there were evidence photos that were leaked in 2021 that showed that these jeans were actually wet and unzipped and they were found washed up by the river they weren't nice naced they weren't placed neatly on a rock so that was weird 10 weeks after the girls went missing and two weeks after the jean shorts were found an indigenous ngobe woman and these are peoples who live in the area of wilderness that the girls went missing she has like a rice paddy in this area that she goes to every day and does work there she says that one day she noticed that a backpack just appeared there in, in an area like as if it had washed up ashore. She swears that the day before she did not see this bag and remember she goes there every day and then all of a sudden it just is there but it's among things that look like they washed up ashore. They take this bag and turn it into police. This bag was a few miles away from where the jeans were found and they're all kind of by this river, this dangerous, uh, windy, powerful river, river that's called, uh, in, it's known as the serpent, but it's called El Culabra or something, or Rio Culebra. I'm sure I'm messing that up. So what was in the bag? Okay, let me tell you. Inside the bag were two pairs of sunglasses, two bras, two cell phones, a Samsung and an iPhone, and Lizanne's camera, and her passport, a water bottle, and $83 in cash. Let's talk about the two bras that are in the bag, because this is weird. First of all, this was a light bag. They didn't pack for, you know, like changes of clothes and stuff like that. So it doesn't seem like these are like extra spare bras in case they need to change their bra. Like that's kind of weird, right? And then when you look at the bras that were found in the bag and you look at pictures of them from that day you can see that the straps the bra straps are black both of them have black bra straps and the two bras that are found in the bag are with black bra straps so it's likely that these are the same bras that they were wearing so would they have like removed their bras while they were in the wilderness like lost for however long and put them in a bag I don't know. The cell phones and the camera were in working condition and we're gonna talk about what was found on them. But before we get into that, I need to tell you this other crazy thing. So basically, this search had been scaled back before the backpack was found. Once the backpack was found, the search picked back up again. But this time it was different. There was a search that was led by a certain tour guide. Tour guide F, AKA Feliciano. This guy was leading the search. He was the last person to see the girls alive. A lot of the people in town had very bad things to say about him. According to a police report leaked to the Daily Beast, this tour leader told authorities he had met the Dutch tourists, Chris and Lizanne, the same day they disappeared from Bocate on April 1st, 2014. He claimed to have scheduled a hike with them for the following day and that he went looking when they never showed up. Witnesses say this is the same guide who met with Chris and Lizanne less than 24 hours before they disappeared. And they say that during that meeting, he offered them a full package tour, including a guided hike up to the nearby Continental Divide and an overnight stop at his ranch deep in the jungle on the far side of the mountains. It says, for unknown reasons, the women declined. 
Early the next morning, they set out to climb that same hike that he offered to guide them on. They went on it by themselves and they were never seen again. Turns out this guide has had complaints made against him by female tourists in the area who say like he's a great guide. He's actually one of the best guides out here. He knows the area like the back of his hand. But he's like really weird and inappropriate with women, especially if they're alone. I found this trip advisor review for him. He has like a page. They're all mostly really good, but there's like two really bad reviews. Uh, this one in particular says great guide, but not for women traveling alone. And it says, it took me almost a year to finally post this review. I strongly recommend women not to, to not, sorry, hire Feliciano as your guide if you're by yourself. It's a big contrast if you look at the other reviews where Feliciano is described as a very nice person, which he probably is for many people. I have to say, he's very charming, funny, and you can probably, as you will read in the other reviews, have a great day with him. I did a walking tour with him. He's the guy that knows the area by heart. Not long after we left, he subtly started to flirt with me and also touching me, first my hand, but also my arm, shoulder, and legs, even after telling him many times to stop doing that. He wears a big machete and suggested to chop off my legs. This, of course, was a joke, but still. He has an obsession for Northern European women, and I felt very unsafe. It's a, it's a personal story, but Google his name and you'll unfortunately find more stories like this about him. Date of experience, September, 2018. There's another woman. Her name is Nina Von Ron or Roan, and she rented a home from Feliciano, and she said she had a horrible experience, okay? She says, he is a mountain guide, who speaks a little English and even a little German, and we always saw him with women. He works only with female tourists from Europe and a little bit from Canada. He has a preference for German, Dutch, the two girls that went missing, Chris and Lizanne were Dutch, and all people coming from Northern and Eastern Europe, but he doesn't like Americans. Okay, it says he's physically very strong for his age. I saw him carry super heavy bags of coffee beans and fruit from his garden as if it was absolutely nothing. He is a true force of nature. He's able to walk quickly for long distances in the mountains without getting tired. She said that she rented a small cottage from him on his isolated farm. And for several weeks, she said she began to feel trapped as if he was spying on her. She said he started advancing towards her romantically and when she denied him, he went crazy. She said, quote, like a panther. He literally jumped on my neck. He even tried to lift me up as if to see how much I weighed. There are many stories about this guide other than this, like many more. Listen to this. According to leaked police uh, reports, Panamanian prosecutors say that this guy, Feliciano, after the girls went missing, he went into their room that they were renting before authorities were able to go in and they accused him of tampering with evidence. He went into those girls' room and did something. Speaking of evidence and tampering with evidence, we need to talk about the photographs. There's a bunch of photos on the camera from before April 1st. Then there's April 1st, the last day they were basically seen by anyone in the day they went on the hike and in those pictures they look really happy they're taking all these posed happy pictures and it doesn't seem like there's anyone with them at all they seem to be just them too and then there is this picture of chris and it's really different from the prior pictures she is not smiling like all the other ones it almost seems like a candid and it just it seems different. And then after that picture, things get weird. First of all, there is a missing picture, okay? This is known as picture 509 because all the pictures are numbered and it's like foolproof of the way they're numbered, like it doesn't skip pictures. The last daytime pictures are pictures 507 and 508. And then there's this gap and that's when you have the weird pictures that show up days later in the middle of the night, the 90 plus pictures. There is one photograph between the last daytime pictures and before the crazy nighttime pictures, which is 509 and it's missing. And here's the weird thing about it. First of all, the way it's missing, it's not just deleted from the camera. Like let's say you took a picture, you didn't like it, you deleted it. No, it is deleted from the SIM card because usually if you delete it off the camera, you can still recover it with different programs from the memory card. 
But if you take that memory card, you don't put it into the computer and delete it like that, you can't recover it. And that's how it was deleted. Additionally, the fact that it's deleted uh, in itself is weird because there were pictures that were like blurry and sort of like weird pictures that you would think if they cared about, you know, deleting pictures they didn't like, that those would have been deleted too. But like they left pictures that seemed like they were delete worthy, but 509 is missing. 507 and 508, okay? Now these in these images, you can see that Chris her shorts are like muddy and she's got mud on her legs too and it seems like maybe she slipped and fell or something then it's 509 the missing picture a week later april 8th april 8th is the next picture after the deleted picture so it's like what how this that picture was deleted and then a week later they start taking pictures 90 pictures were taken between 1 a.m and 4 a.m and they're like they look like they obviously it's dark right and they're in the jungle and from this we can determine that there's at least one of them that's alive that is taking these photos the pictures indicate the girls are lost because they have several things like they show a twig with plastic bags on it like sort of like a marker and then one of the pictures seems like they were they were trying to ask for help like there's a mirror that they placed maybe to create some sort of reflection this is what like survivalists interpret it as and they had used their straps to sort of maybe indicate something so there are a lot of theories as to why these pictures were taken some people think maybe it was so dark they were using the flash to light the way um, and then some people say uh, maybe they were lost and they were taking pictures of the area so that if they passed it again or they went somewhere else they could know where they were some people say something happened they wanted to leave behind clues as to what happened and i don't know how you want to interpret that i've read things that support and refute each one of those theories then there's this odd picture and it looks like people believe it's uh the back of chris kremer's head because she had this sort of strawberry blonde hair and that's what the the, the color of the hair in this picture and people say that like on the right side of her head there seems to be sort of blood there and they're wondering if this is uh, just a picture documenting this injury like that chris somehow suffered a head injury and then there's the debate of was she alive during this time was she not um did just lizanne take this picture just for proof that this happened to explain it to show it to see how bad it was in the dark so there are also these images of what are known as monkey bridges so these monkey bridges are basically remember then gobe indigenous people that i told you about i hope i'm saying that right in gobe and go um they make these bridges monkey bridges they're very hard to navigate and they say that even the native people who can like have fallen and died on these like they're just really hard to cross and it seems like the girls may have attempted to cross this bridge now this is a point of contention what about the official story from the panamanian government that they fell from the monkey bridge and their bones were washed down river uh, no way why not because they would never ever go on it now let's talk about the cell phone information because that's also very telling so i want to show you basically this graph chart whatever you want to call it and it shows the dates of the calls the time they were made on each person's phone so you've got chris kremers she had the iphone 4 and lizanne Froon had the samsung galaxy and you can see they start by trying to make calls to 112, which is like the international Dutch, like 911. They also try to call 911. And they call several times uh, on like really hours after they started their hike. Then they call again on the second. And then on the third was the last call attempt. After that point, they're trying to preserve their phone's battery and check for signal. None of these calls ever go through because the service is so bad. So then there's like a pattern that emerges like around the same time, like in the morning and afternoon, they turn on the phone and check for signal. And then when there's no signal, they turn off the phone to preserve the battery. On April 4th, Lizanne Samsung runs out of battery and it never is used again after that. 
the iPhone still has battery. They continue with this pattern of turning it on every day at around the same time to check for signal. But then something weird starts happening where between April 5th and 11, which is the last time the iPhone was used, the phone, when it's turned on, the pin code is never entered or the wrong pin code was entered. So remember, this is Chris's phone. Chris is the one that we assume had that picture of a potential head injury. If Chris was somehow injured and Lizanne started using her phone because her phone died on the 4th and so she started using her phone on the 5th, some sort of incident happened, maybe she didn't know her passcode and so she couldn't enter the pin or maybe some third person was involved and in trying to enter the pin, we don't know. but Or maybe someone was disoriented and couldn't remember the pin, we don't know. So from that point, it's like the phone can't really be accessed, but it's still being turned on because I think without a pin, you can still make emergency calls. So then after that, you have that happening until the 6th. Between the 6th and the 11th, there's no phone activity. Within that gap, which is the 8th, right, is when all of a sudden there are all those photographs being taken. And we know that there's a gap with the camera from the first to the eighth. So it's like they were taking pictures, everything was good, things go south, they start trying to use the phone, the phone, the phone, the phone till the sixth. Something happens on the sixth, the phone isn't being used anymore. On the eighth now, all these pictures are taken and then no more pictures after the eighth on the camera, no more phone activity between the 6th to the 11th. In the 11th, there's one final phone activity that happens. The phone gets turned on, 10.51 in the morning, they check signal, no pin entered. An hour later at 11.56, it is switched off. And there was 22% battery left and the phone was never turned on again after that. Was Lizanne the only one left and she was taking pictures? Was there some incident that happened after the 6th? to Chris and then Lizanne was trying to figure it out and then now it's the 8th she's trying to take pictures of everything that happened and now she's waiting waiting I don't know the 11th she decides to use the phone again very bizarre very odd but that is all the phone information the Daily Beast they decide they want to talk to Feliciano the tour guide they're trying to get in contact with him, calling him. He stands them up like they arrange meetings. He doesn't show up. It happened several times. Finally, uh, he's on the phone with them and is willing to talk. And this is what he says. Talk to the attorney general if you want information or talk to Sina Proc. I already told the police everything I know, he says, but he adds a final thought just before hanging up on me again, says the reporter. Those girls could have been saved if the Sina Proc people knew how to do their jobs. I met the Hollandesas, so that's Spanish for like the Dutch girls, in a town, but never saw them after that. I spent many days helping Sinaproc search for those poor girls. I even met with their families when they came to Boquete. I did everything I could, he finishes screaming into the phone. Sinaproc, which is, you know, like the, they were responsible for the search and a lot of the investigation, they are heavily criticized for not handling it well. Um, they, they didn't want to search in the beginning. They said the girls were partying and then once they did search they kind of botched it. They didn't search for long. It just the when they would collect certain of the pieces of evidence that were found they didn't do fingerprint samples. There were like 30 unidentified fingerprints on it which was later discovered by the Dutch authorities which means they weren't using gloves. It was just like not a well executed investigation by any sort of like modern standard. It was described as a clusterfuck by people in the area, okay? Here's the weird thing, because after 10 days, Cineproc, they stopped searching for the girls. Uh, the Dutch authorities searched for about two months-ish and then they left. But then there was a third search party. And who was leading this search party? Tour Guide F, a.k.a. Feliciano. And guess what is found 
in this search, this time. The girl's remains. They were found near the Serpent River, not too far away from when the backpack and the jeans were found. They found part of Lizanne's left leg, okay? The, her femur, tibia, and her foot that was still in her shoe. And there were fractures in the bone in Lizanne's foot. So it appears that at some point she fell and fractured her foot. Then they also found the left half of Chris's pelvis and her right number 10 rib. And her remains were also found along the Serpent River. But the way the bones were found and the bones conditions and everything like that was also odd. So there was this whole thing about the fact that Chris's pelvis or half of her pelvic bone was bleached. Bones can be bleached by the sun, but they look a certain kind of way. So they aren't bleached evenly, but rather there are some parts that face upwards that almost look burnt and they're dark. And then there are other parts that look white. And, and this is known as extreme bleaching gradients, but that is not how Chris's pelvis looked. It looked different. And then also sun bleaching makes the bones very brittle. And that's also not how Chris's pelvis looked. Forensic experts found traces of phosphorus on Chris's pelvic bone. So investigators theorize, well, this could be like exposure to the elements because phosphorus can be found in soil. But then that was like the hypothesis that the officials in Panama were saying, but then the local Panamanian um, media were, were like, no, there is no phosphorus in the soil that this was found in. So this kind of doesn't fit with their hypothesis. What it does kind of fit with is another hypothesis, which is more of a foul play hypo hypothesis, which is that um, lime can be used, it's a chemical that contains phosphorus, can be used to speed up decomposition of bodies when you're trying to dispose of a body. And in this region, uh, the Sinaloa Mexican cartels, they have some sort of influence there. And they're the hitmen's. I think they're known as Cesarios or Sicarios. I'm probably saying it wrong. Associated with the cartel who use this method. I feel like it would be Cesario. Of course, no. Of course, I'm wrong. Sicario. Sicario. Okay. Sicario. Cesario. The hell's wrong with me? When they found Chris's pelvic bone, they found other bones. And it turns out that these other bones were older bones that had been in that area for longer meaning they were exposed to the sun for longer. You would think based on the fact that these bones were in those same same area longer, they would be bleached or more bleached than uh, Chris's pelvic bone, but that wasn't the case. They were not bleached. So why is Chris's pelvic bone bleached? And why is it bleached in a way that doesn't really go with traditional sun bleaching? According to a police report, uh, again, that leaked police report, they were basically going off the theory that this was a homicide. This is what was weird, okay? The internal records that were leaked did not go along with the official story that was said in public. In public, the authorities were saying this was like an accident, they fell, they got lost, which is very likely what happened, but that some sort of animal or something scavenged them, and it was just, they succumbed to the elements. But internally, based off of Feliciano going and tampering and what he knew and the way the bodies were found, the remains and him finding them or whatever, they actually wrote in one of these leaked police reports that quote, cartel style dismemberment tactics may have been used to dispose of the victims. There was this guy who worked the case, who was part of the forensics, who worked on the bones and he came out anonymously he didn't want to reveal who he was because what he would say was going to directly contradict the official story. He is a member of Pan Panama's Institute of Legal Medicine and Forensic Science and has direct knowledge of the case. He said, quote, there is no evidence that animals scavenged the Hollandaises. Even under magnification, there are no discernible scratches of any kind on the bones, neither of natural nor cultural origin. There are no marks on the bones at all. No claw marks, no bite marks, no marks that would indicate they had been broken up on the river rocks either. There were all these things that didn't match what the official story was. 
And so then comes the question of like, okay, why? Well, according to people familiar with the region and stuff, they're saying it's because of money. So a huge percent of the GDP of Panama comes from tourism. And they were worried, the officials, that if it spread, that there was some sort of, you know, violent crime occurring, that someone was targeting tourists, that it would be bad for business. And so it was in their best interest to say this was an accident and so that the tourism industry wouldn't be affected. Till this day, their cause of death is undetermined, but officially everyone's leaning towards accident. Chris Kramer's parents come out, Chris Kramer's, they kept saying that we don't think this was an accident. We think this was foul play. There are things that are not adding up. Adding fuel to the fire of this foul play theory was um, an article that came out that said that there have been many disappearances and deaths of young women in the same area around the same time that Chris and Lizanne went missing. And we think they're all connected and it's foul play because what ended up happening was in 2017, a couple years later, there was a girl who was killed in Panama, not too far from where Chris and Lizanne went missing. Catherine Johannett's body was found on a hiking trail. Investigators are noting similarities to a 2014 case. Johannett, a Columbia University graduate, set off on a solo day hike last Thursday. When she didn't return, she was reported missing. A police officer found her body along this secluded hiking trail. A reminder of a 2014 murder in Panama when the scattered remains of two Dutch tourists were found in Boquette. Rumors started swirling that, oh, it's not, it's it's a serial killer. Like, is, it, is, is Feliciano a serial killer? or is this is this someone else what's going on and so the thing is there are other suspects that people have mentioned that I want to mention to you just to give you a full picture other than the Feliciano guy so there is this escaped convict his name is Frank Pardo he broke out of a Panamanian prison in March of 2013 so this this guy Frank Pardo he is a former Sicario which we know um, they're the ones that do the method of of Lyme to you know decompose the body he was convicted of murdering a woman but this was back in the 90s and he's been known to frequent that area around Boquete where the girls went missing and he escaped the prison like a year before the girls went missing then there was this other person known as Hannibal Lecter of Bugaba who was arrested in March of 2017 for cutting up a woman that he met in Facebook. And this was not 20 minutes away from the area where the girls went missing. Then there is a third suspect besides Feliciano. And this is the taxi driver who brought Chris and Lizanne to the Pianista, the hiking trail. He turned up dead exactly damn near a year after the girls went missing. He was supposedly drowned officially, but witnesses and people familiar with the area say that they don't think he was drowned. They think he either knew too much and somebody took him out. This is a person in the area, okay? He, this person is a rock climbing instructor and he was there when they found this taxi driver's body in the water. He says, this witness says, it's a strange thing uh, it's easy to swim there. There's no strong current and we never heard any cries for help or splashing around or anything like he was in trouble. We don't know. He, he didn't hit his head on a rock because there was no blood or bruising. And this person is the one who pulled the taxi driver, Leo Gonzalez, out of the water and tried to give him CPR. He says that there were other cars nearby that day. Those are the facts now. Um, I want to talk about the theories. Let's start with the accident theory. So. The accident theory seems pretty likely. A lot of people, you know, most people say like there's there was most definitely probably an accident. The thing is the the issue isn't so much was there an accident but was there only an accident, right? Was it an accident and they just died and that's it or was there an accident and then someone came in and took advantage of the fact that there was an accident. The thing with the accident theory and people who say there was just an accident is people who criticize this theory, they bring up several things. They talk about the backpack, okay? If the backpack, according to the accident theory, fell in the water and then washed up ashore with all the other stuff, why was it dry? 
And, and what's up with the woman who found it who said she was there the day before and nothing was there and it just sort of appeared. It seems like someone placed that backpack there. Why were their bras there? They had some sort of accent or something. Like what? They took off their bras. They put it in the bag. I don't know. Then there's the issue of the bones, right? People who talk about the accident theory say, well, if there was an accident and that's the only thing that happened and their bodies just were dragged by animals, then why are there no markings on the bones? The bodies decompose really fast. According to every expert, the rate of decomposition is not typical for the environment and the time that they were there. Is there a way to explain these things away? Some people say, well, you know, there are a lot of uh, micro environments in these areas and maybe the way the bones were, were in a micro environment where very specific conditions could lead to decomposition that is atypical for that region. Um, so could, that could explain, let's say maybe why the bones were bleached or things like that. Then regarding the backpack, you know, maybe it was not, did it have to have been submerged in the water like the way it was found? You know, if you look at the pictures, it's possible that it was sort of wedged in there and managed to stay dry and not necessarily washed up there, even though it was close to water. Maybe they, they put the bag there to keep it safe and it remained safe and that's why they were able to get it and it was an accident. That could explain that. So then comes the issue of the missing picture, okay? Why is that picture missing? Okay, we could say maybe they wanted to delete it off their phone. How many times have you taken a picture you delete it off your phone? A lot of, I mean, off your camera, a lot of times. Okay, but how come it's off the memory card which only could have done been done with a laptop and these girls did not get access to a laptop? Could someone have taken the backpack, taken their bras off? Maybe they were assaulted in some way. Maybe they were taken somewhere. Maybe whoever did what they did to them, which by the way, now apparently I'm at the foul play theory because that's where I am. Let's talk about that. Because let's say based off of the photos and the evidence of the cell phone stuff, like they did seem like they were lost and they were looking for help and they couldn't find their way out. Maybe someone stumbled upon them. Maybe someone was following them. Maybe that's the reason why that one picture was deleted and you don't see or hear from them. Then all of a sudden there's all these pictures. What's going on? It's so bizarre. If someone did find them either before the, the pictures on April 8th or after, took them and then, cause like, it, that thing is described as people's backyards. There's no way not to be noticed up there. You're actually passing through people's backyards. It's not really that isolated. And someone saw them and took advantage, and took them back to their place or something, then took their bras and other items and put them in a bag, deleted a photo. Maybe there was one photo that was identifying them and then place the bag to be found. Who could have done that? Tour guide F, right? Feliciano. This is something I want to read you. Okay, it says here, Panamanian prosecutor said he'd entered the woman's rented room prior to questioning and without a police escort, a fact cited in relation to potential evidence having gone missing as well. He had a tour schedule with them in the opposite place. They say, how did the guide know the Dutch women were missing in the Pianista region when officials first questioned him? It said it would be two more months before the victim's remains and clothes and personal belongings would be found near the Pianista Trail. Yet he described the precise location immediately following the disappearance, says the leaked police report. Although none of the first strike rescue parties were able to find the two hikers alive in the early days of the search. Why was it him and his search that found their remains? I feel like if someone did do it, it's this Feliciano guy. If, if someone did do it, he's always on that trail. He's creepy with women. Maybe he followed them. Maybe the taxi driver saw him. That's why the taxi driver was killed. Maybe he was lying in wait and took an opportunity and then tried to hide the evidence, discard the, the bones, do the thing, look like the hero in the situation. I don't know. I don't know. You tell me. If you ask me what I think, I think 
it's probably a combination of accident and foul play some some way somehow but i'd love to know what you guys think please let me know in the comments below thank you guys so much for watching and i'll see you guys in my next one bye <music>